When We Awake by Glenn Hall, Chapter 2 First the natural, then the spiritual, for he who has ears to hear. O oh, cruel, cruel, I wailed, is it nothing to you that you leave me here alone? Psyche, did you ever love me at all? Love you? Why, Maya, what have I ever had to love save you and our grandfather the fox? But I did not want her to bring even the fox in now. But sister, you will follow me soon. You don't think any mortal life seems a long thing to me tonight. And how would it be better if I had lived? I suppose I should have been given to some king in the end. Perhaps such another is our father. And there you see again how little difference there is between dying and being married. To leave your home, to lose you, Maya, and the fox, to lose one's maidenhead, to bear a child. They are all deaths. Indeed, indeed, Oriol, I am not sure that this which I go to is not the best. This! Yes. Oriol, she said, her eyes shining. I am going, you see, to the mountain. You remember how we used to look and long, and all the stories of my gold and amber house up there against the sky, where we thought we should never really go? The greatest king of all was going to build it for me. If only you could believe it, sister. No, listen, do not let grief shut up your ears and harden your heart. Is it my heart that's hardened? From Till We Have Faces, pages 73 to 75. In this passage, from Till We Have Faces, Oriol has gone to visit her beautiful sister, Psyche, the night before she will be sacrificed to Un Ungit, the god of Gloam. She hates all of the gods because they remain so secretive and mysterious. But she hates Ungit in particular, because she is now stealing away her beloved sister. Psyche, however, does not fear her fate. She has always longed to go to the mountain of the gods. Oriol went to Psyche to try to comfort her, and it turns out that Psyche has to comfort Oriol. Psyche even calls Oriol Maya, the Greek name for baby. Oriol becomes bitter towards Psyche, although she honestly loves her. Why? Because Psyche sees in the spiritual, and Oriol, a type of carnal Christian, sees only in the natural. This demonstrates a very common trait in God's people. Many believers become satisfied in their spiritual walk with God and remain spiritual babies all or most of their lives. When confronted with other believers who live more consistently by the precepts of God's word, they become bitter and accusative. Often they make accusations that the more spiritual believer is legalistic or even unloving. Sometimes they attempt to make the spiritual one feel or believe that he has arrogantly condemned them when, in reality, his righteous way of life smites their conscience. This happens to Oriol here. And we see the central idea repeat itself several times in the book, Till We Have Faces. Lewis here draws upon the theme of the carnal versus the spiritual Christian. The major part of Lewis's book contains Oriol's complaint against the gods. She accuses the gods of remain, remaining hidden from human view. She believes that they do not fully reveal themselves or their purposes to us so that they can just use and abuse us mortals. How can we ever please them or know what they want us to do? Comprise two questions she pits against them. And we too must confess that we sometimes become exasperated or angry because we do not see God clearly and do not understand events in our lives. I know that I, like Oriol, have railed against God at times because I did not see him nor perceive his ways with me. I remember one night that I learned that a client would not pay the $23,500 he owed me. I stormed out into my backyard, railing at God. I challenged God, and I challenged Satan. I told Satan I would destroy him right then and there if I had the power. I screamed at God to meet me face to face and deal with me like a man. My family needed money to pay the mortgage and buy food. I had worked hard. I deserved the money. This was not fair, and I intended to tell him so face to face. Like Oriol, I complained against God. But I complain as a fool without knowledge, without faith in the love that our dear Father cares for our every need, and without faith in his utter sovereignty over our affairs. I wanted to meet God face to face so that I could yell in his face. I thought I was a mature Christian. 
but I was far from ready to see him as he is. Paul's dissertation on communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 represents the culmination and summary of his teaching on things offered to idols, which begins in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Those four chapters deal extensively with this one issue, which begins, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Paul begins this teaching with a notice and a warning. First, he warns that knowledge leads to pride, even knowledge of this doctrine that he now wants to teach. Right after introducing this brand new topic, he quickly says, If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. I believe Paul spoke this way because he now introduces Christians to a profound mystery and he wants them to hear with spiritual ears. Jesus often sets off his mysteries with similar words like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Isaiah means the same thing when he says, give ear and hear my voice, listen and hear my speech. In Isaiah 28 verse 23, when we see these and similar cues, we need to understand that we have just entered into the world of God's concealed, mysterious word. This means it is time to pray for God's revelation because we will not be able to understand it in the futility of our own thinking. Our fleshly, carnal minds simply cannot perceive God's truths. Yet Paul says, once you do, not, once you do understand, do not become puffed up about it. For 23 years of almost daily Bible study, I saw food sacrificed to idols as a Corinthian and a non-Christian problem. After all, who among us has ever seen, much less eaten, literal food sacrificed to a literal idol? I have not and do not know anyone who has. I basically relegated Paul's teaching to the Corinthians and other pagan idol-worshiping cultures. I thought I understood food sacrificed to idols and I believed it had no relevance to me or anyone in my culture. I thought I knew. But I was wrong. I did not know anything yet, as I ought to know. Paul prepares us, though, to begin apprehending God's mysteries early in his book. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 16, he says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of I am that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The natural man does not receive or understand the things of God. Brethren, this describes both the non-Christian and the natural Christian who does not comprehend the things of the Spirit of God. This characterizes the person who does not walk according to the Spirit and hence does not walk in obedience to Christ's commands. Paul depicts the carnal-minded Christian in Romans. In Romans 8, verses 5 through 7, he says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, 
for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. Before Paul gets in, into the spiritual meat of his Corinthian epistle, he tells his readers that he could not previously speak to them as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, he says, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and visions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? From 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. We see then that the natural man of 1 Corinthians 2 is the carnally minded or the carnal Christian of Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 3. The book of Hebrews says that solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil, in Hebrews 5, verse 14. The doctrine of food sacrificed to idols is solid food. For the maturing or mature Christian, not the one satisfied with his own perceptions of his spirituality or his carnal thoughts and actions. In Lewis's passage quoted above, Oriol represents a carnal Christian who cannot hear spiritual things. Rather than seeking the will of God, she pursues the matter by natural means and begins a course of disaster. So how do we begin to comprehend God and the hidden mysteries of Christ? We approach our Lord and his word in humility. We admit that we do not really know God nor his ways. We confess that we do not know the deep things of God. We realize that we cannot understand his word and the futility of our own thinking. In fact, we must confess and acknowledge that even we Christians are yet sinners who live in a body of flesh prone to sin. We willingly confide to him that we ourselves do not have ears to hear nor eyes to see his spiritual truths. Therefore, each of us must cry out to him, Father, Open my ears that I might hear. Open my eyes that I might see. I long to understand your ways and pray for more of your Holy Spirit that I might walk in those ways. I long to know you and have fellowship with you. This is the cry of the heart upon which God has begun to write his law. According to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 through 12, which says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Again, in order to begin to comprehend the hidden mysteries of Christ, we must approach God and his word in humility. We need to understand and confess that we do not yet really know God nor his deep mysteries. This brings us to the difference between the old and the new covenants. Under the old covenant, we and all those under Judaism or any other false religion believe that our good works will bring us into fellowship with God. Under the new covenant, however, we learn that fellowship with God by faith in Jesus Christ, will bring us into good works and obedience to his word. As long as we approach God and his word in our natural minds and attempt to understand it by only logical reasoning, we will never apprehend its truth. We must take hold of Paul's words where he says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. He said this before he attempted to teach the Corinthians anything about God. Jesus says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. From John 6, verse 63. Only our relationship with Jesus and our dependence upon the Holy Spirit will enable us to walk in his truth. End of chapter 2